and 19 world champion of public speaking, TM Mark Brown, with his presentation entitled Stronger Together. TM Mark, the podium's all yours. <laughs> Salam, my friends. Greetings. How are you all today? Please tell me you're doing well. Excellent. Feel free to use the reaction button, or if you'd like, open your cameras. I like to see the people I'm speaking with, and I am just thrilled and honored to share some time with you today. To those of you who may be unfamiliar with me, I am Mark Brown, and I was blessed enough to win the Toastmasters World Championship of Public Speaking in 1995, which means it was in the previous millennium. And trust me, I do have the VHS videotape to prove it. <laughs> but I am really thrilled to be here. It's morning for me here in central Georgia where I live. And because of COVID, I've spent much of my time working in my home office. And I live in the country, which means I get to look out two windows in my workspace and I can see all kinds of creatures that come their way in my backyard. On any given day, I will see squirrels, turtles, rabbits, different kinds of birds. I see deer quite a bit, though not reindeer for those who believe in Santa Claus. Once in a while, I'll see a rat snake and even armadillo, which my wife says looks like a large rat wearing armor. I guess it's called an armor dillo for a reason. That was my first bad joke. Thank you for laughing, Khalid. I appreciate that. However, every once in a while, I look out that window and I'll grab my father's binoculars, which he bought in 1964, and I'll see an ant hill. I have no idea how large ant hills may be where you live, but here in central Georgia, they're not that large. You may be about, about that big off the ground, you know. But you can't miss an anthill. And I remember as a child growing up in Jamaica, I was always fascinated by anthills. Invariably, I'll go outside and I will see the anthill. And sometimes a foreign creature finds its way on the anthill. It could be a cockroach or a wasp, a grasshopper, or maybe even a lizard. And when that happens, I notice a flurry of activity begins to take place on the anthill. Now, I do know that ant ants are very strong creatures. I was taught that as a child, they'll carry you know, six, seven times their weight. But a grasshopper or a wasp is much larger than the ants. However, I notice the ants all seem to swarm on this one invader of their home. And before long, it's a flurry of activities. They descend on this creature and begin to rip it apart limb from limb. And I'll see the, the, a, a, a grasshopper's leg is broken off and carted into the anthill, perhaps to feed the grubs and young ones inside. Now, I do have to get back to work, at least to pretend to work. I'll come back to my workspace. And maybe an hour or two later, I'll go back outside to inspect the anthill and see what has happened. To my surprise, the anthill is restored to its normal condition. It does not seem to be disturbed. And there is no evidence that the cockroach, the wasp, or the grasshopper had ever been on that anthill. It is fascinating. But then I realize that the ants individually could never overcome a wasp or a grasshopper. But collectively, they all descend upon this one creature, this one invader, and together they're able to overcome the invader, to kill the threat, and to rip it apart and find value in its parts. And then they work together to rebuild the anthill as if nothing ever happened. Now, why in the world am I telling you a story about ants from my backyard? What well, is very simple? It turns out that the ants are able to overcome an invader, maybe a cockroach. I call it the COVID cockroach. 
because they work together and they realize that they are stronger together. It's a simple principle. Now, when I was eight or nine years old, I didn't understand it. Truthfully, when I was 10, 11, 12 years old, I didn't fully understand it. I got into my teen years and I fully didn't understand it until I had the opportunity <laughs> to play my favorite sport. Now, I do not know what sport rules and reigns where you live. And Jamaicans are known for athletics, track and field. We have had the fastest runners in the world since the 1940s. If you agree, use the reaction button. Give me a thumbs up. Give me a heart. Give me a or something. Thank you so much. Yes, Alan, I got, I got, I got a live thumb and a live hand. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Okay. I wanted to play football. Now, Americans call it soccer. But let's face it. I call it football. You know why? You use a foot, kick a ball. Makes sense, right? Yeah. And in high school, I wanted so badly to be on the football team. And in high school, I was younger, I was fitter. And in high school, most importantly, I had hair. <laughs> and I wanted to play ball. And the thing is, in high school in Jamaica, back in the 1970s, 1970s the truth is, I, that's a long time ago. Uh, and in the 70s, it was a big deal to play ball in Jamaica for a high school football team. We had 18 uniforms for our boys to play. Our high school tournament in a country of only 1.8 million people was played in the national stadium, the only stadium in the country. And high school football in America, you may get 100 or 200 people going to a game. In Jamaica back then, you'd get 10, 15, 20,000 people watching high school football. I went to an all boys school, which means we all had to try out for the team. Can you imagine? We have 18 uniforms, and the first day of tryouts, 120 boys show up for 18 uniforms. We practice from the end of June through the beginning of September when the season started, and the coach would eliminate players every week, but he would keep 25 or 26 until the last cut day. And the last cut day in 1976, my older brother and I had been on the team training for two and a half months. And when he listed his team on the team sheet, my brother, Woody, didn't make it. But I did. And it was a wonderful feeling. I was on the team. How cool is that? And I can recall we had 18 boys, 11 starters, and we were playing international rules back then. When you sub out, you're out for the whole game. When you're in, you're in. So players had to compete for a spot. One of the players was a kid named Leo. And he was a skinny kid, really skinny. He had buck teeth and stuff. And he, was, he worked hard. I remember he actually went to practice, played in pain because he didn't want to lose his spot on the team. Talk about commitment. And in 1976, we began our season. 11 starters playing in the stadium. And game after game, our coach, Alex McCoy, would sub different people in. And it's some out and some in and different people. And towards the end of the season, we came down to our last game. And Leo was the only person on the team who had not gotten any playing time in the tournament. He was the only kid. Now, the last game of the season, it's like 10 minutes to go. And one of our players, one of our captains gets hurt. Gilbert Chan, we called him Gilly. And Alti McCoy looked down the bench and he saw Leo on the end. I guess Leo thought his job was to make sure the bench didn't go anywhere. He was to guard the bench. But coach said, your turn to play Leo. He popped up, began to do jump, and Jackson began to stretch. There's about 15,000 people in the stadium. And they see him getting warmed up. Oh, wow, he's finally going to play. And then coach says, go in for Gilbert. Hold him down. We're losing 2-0. I don't think we can win, but don't let them score any more goals. Got it? Yes, coach. And Leo began what I call the walk. They had put the bench up against the end of the grandstand with an angled cycling track. Because some stadiums have a cycling track that's angled like this. If you know what I mean, just give me a thumbs up. He began to walk down the cycling track, across the long jump pit, across eight lanes of running track to the sidelines. I told the official, I'm going in for number five, Gilbert Chang. And the referee came by and said, oh, no, I don't think so. What do you mean? 
your team has used all their subs. That can't be right. Well, you can always call the coach. They call the coach. The game has stopped. And 15,000 people are watching this drama play out. As McCoy comes down the cycling track, across the long jump pit, across the running track, and he brings his team sheet with him and says, hey, I want to sub him for number five. And for he says, you can't. You've used all your subs. That's not possible. We're allowed to have three subs on the goalkeeper. I sub my goalkeeper. I sub two subs. I have one sub left. This is his kid, Leo. And for he said, no, you're wrong. The rule says you're allowed to have three subs, including the goalkeeper. You sub your goalkeeper and you sub two others. That's your three subs. This young man cannot play. He must go back to the bench. In front of 15,000 people, Leo turns around and walks back across eight lanes of running track, across the long jump pit, up the angled cycling track, sits at the edge of the bench till the game ends, the season ends. He did not get a single minute of playing time, and he was just embarrassed in front of 15,000 people. I can remember it like it was yesterday, because that kid, Leo, his full name is Leo Brown. Mark Leo Brown. That kid was me. How would you feel? I was 15. Well, I knew as embarrassing as it was, I had my friends to lean on. The following day at school, my friends saw me and they laughed. Ha, 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 ha. Man, you got embarrassed. Ha, 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 ha. What do you do when a dream is taken away from you? Your heart is broken. I had a choice. I could wait a year or just quit. Now, if anybody here has a child who's 15 years old or a grandchild, you know to a 15-year-old, a year is forever. But you know what? The following year, I went back to tryouts with 150 guys. <laughs> went through tryouts. I made the team again. And in September of 1977, I went down that cycling track, across the long jump pit, across four lanes of running track to take my place as a starting right fullback of my high school team, a team that went on that year to become one of the best teams in the tournament. Truth is, that was me, don't mind my short shorts, and that was my team. We were regional champions 1977. I'm the guy in the back at the end under the word champions. That was November 12th, 1977. We were the number two team in the country. We lost in the national championship, okay? But here's the thing. Why do I tell you this to do with your conference and being stronger together? It took me a year <laughs> to begin to learn the lesson, and it took an anthill even years later to reinforce to me a simple truth. I made the team the second year because I had to understand my role the first year, and here's the point. My role was to help the 11 starting players to improve, to get better, to shoot better, to control, to head the ball, to kick the ball. I was to help them to become better at their job. And while I did that without my realizing it, as I helped them get better, I got better. As they improved, I improved. I was a new kid on the block, but I was going through the process. And right now, Iraq, Egypt, you may feel like you are the new kids on the block, but everything you do together will strengthen the entire team. You don't have to be the best at anything. You just have to keep growing stronger together. You are four nations as one, and I am so excited about this because of the condition our world is in right now. Toastmasters is amazing. In a world where conflict and disagreement and war seems to be happening everywhere, we at Toastmasters can embrace people of different ethnicity, of different countries, different faith, different religion. We can build bonds beyond borders and become a team that is stronger together. 
And that gets me so excited because you're doing it. You're proving it to the world. It can be done if only our world's leaders could learn from Toastmasters. And the thing is, we don't have to be super best at anything. We simply have to embrace each other, lock arms, work together as a team. And maybe you may think your particular role, Iraq or Egypt, is small because you're new. But as you learn and grow together, everybody gets uplifted. I'll prove that to you. I told you earlier that my high school team was number two in the nation. And we were, okay? We were. But get this. Every year, what they would do is they would arrange for an all-star team to be created. Now, when your team, my team there, wins number two in the country, chances are you may get six or seven players who are all-stars on the all-star team. I'm curious. I'm going to ask you all to use your chat for a second and type in a number of our 18 players. How many of us do you think made the all-star team? We're number two in the nation. Give me a number in the chat. Uh, look, whoa, God is very ambitious. He says 18, okay? Anybody else? Give me a number. How many of us do you think made the all-star team? Just type it in real quick. Not only, okay, we got five, we got 18, we got seven. These are, thank you. These are wonderful numbers, five, 11, 12, and all valid numbers. I get it, okay? I get it. Here's the truth. When they pick the all-star team, from this group of guys who you see 18, 18 players there, from that group, they only chose two of us. What? Only two? Yes. And of the two, none started the All-Star game. They were late substitutes at the end of the All-Star game because our team really didn't have that many stars. We interviewed, they interviewed the coach in the local paper, Coach Alton McCoy, and he said this, and my team is called Calabar for short, C-Bar. He said C-Bar's win was all teamwork. I wanted to catch that. He said our win was all teamwork. Here's my point. You are a district with new team members, and you have to what goals you want to achieve. But if you work as a team like ants in, a, in an anthill, It'll make all the difference. Here's why. Principle, to achieve your goals, understand your role is valuable. I'll say it again. To achieve your goals, understand your role is valuable. Now, when I say your role, I mean your individual role. Please allow me to clarify. I've been involved in Toastmasters since 1993. It'll be 30 years next year. You mean I think I'm that old? In a couple of months, I'll be 61 years old. It's not my fault. I look this good. I blame my wife for that. She's wonderful. But in truth, even in our local meetings, I've met individuals who say, well, I'm not the club president. I'm only the SAA. Well, you know, I don't give any speech. I don't do speech contests. I'm not that good. I'm only learning. So listen, I encourage you. No, I implore you. Remove the word only from that conversation. Only is insignificant. You are not. I am proud to be SAA. I'm proud to do table topics. I get to be timer. How cool is that? And trust me. Yes, I won the world title in, a, in the previous millennium. And I do have the VHS videotape to prove it. But at my local club, Macon Toastmasters, Macon, Georgia, I am a role player. I was generally about with her last Monday. My next meeting, Mark Brown, world champion of public speaking. I get to be timer and I love it. I even have my virtual timing backgrounds in, my, in Zoom so I can do that. It matters not what role you play, it's how well you play your role. And as you build, Bonds beyond borders, assimilate, invite everyone to play their role well, just as a skinny, not me, buck teeth kid had to play his role well back in 1976 to elevate the entire team. And after a year, I became a different part of the team, but we were a team. We were a team so good as a team, we couldn't find the stars. We didn't need the stars because everyone understood that their role was valuable.
I say to you, District 2020, you will be stronger together when you understand that your role is valuable. And one more thought I want to leave with you is this. Consider each other community and family. Now, I know it's hard when you're going beyond borders to, to think of family and community, but how can you encourage, lift, and inspire each other as members of your community? How can you give someone the satisfaction and the knowledge you have, they have support from you because to you, they are important? How can you manifest or make community look real to people in your, in, in, in your, in your club and in your district? It's simple. Let them know that you are a part of a crew, even when things go wrong. A quick story I, I want to share with you. Before we began doing our contest with semifinals and regional quarterfinals, back in the day, we had club, area, division, district, region, and then final. Had to give three, three talks, not two. And one year at convention, the regional for those outside North America was being held, and a speaker got up to speak in the contest. Went on stage, introduced, and he said three words and he lost his space. He got lost. What am I going to say now? He paused, breathed again, and restarted. And he failed again. He tried one more time. He got a few words out, froze, turned, and walked off the platform. This is a semifinal for Toastmasters, and there are eight contestants there who all want to win. And I witnessed that day something that touched my heart, a true sense of bonding beyond borders. Those other contestants from different countries all stood up, went over to this one contestant, embraced them, encouraged them. It was the, one of the most moving things I've ever seen, because even though they all wanted to win the contest, they understood here was a fellow Toastmaster who went through a difficult season. How can we support them, encourage them, and lift them at a time when we also want to win. That's community. Individuals from different parts of the world forging bonds beyond borders. That's what it means to be a part of a Toastmasters community. But I have one more thought for you, and it's this. We can be a Toastmasters family. Say what? Yes, I honestly believe in Toastmasters, it's more than just community. I believe it's up to family. What I mean by that? For me, the bridge between community and family is real. And I believe if we make, if we make a commitment to each other as family, it'll be valuable to those who are part of our organization, a part of our district, and a part of our wild, wider Toastmasters world. Here it is. I believe not only is our role valuable, I believe our commitment is valuable as well. With all my heart, I believe that. And I urge you all to fulfill your commitment to grow stronger together and build bonds together. You know why? To survive our tough times, our commitment is also valuable. Here's my thought for you, okay? I want you to meet somebody real quickly. This is my daughter, Andrine. I call her my princess. She's 38 years old and an attorney living in Virginia. And in 2019, she left home and took a five-day vacation in August to fly to, get this, to Colorado. Why? To join mom and dad at the Toastmasters International Convention. It's her holiday, her vacation. She chose to come with her old dad and her mom to Toastmasters. And that looks, that's a very good picture. The only way to make this photograph better is to remove the guy in the middle. My wife, Andrea, of 40 years, by the way, now on my right, and my daughter, Andrine, my princess, both chose to wear gold and black that day. And if you're honest, they make me look good. <laughs> but why bring up Andrine? Well, back in 2018, my princess was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, which is a difficult disease to deal with. And she became an activist trying to raise money for multiple sclerosis research. In 2019, they had a walk, what they call the MS Walk for Multiple Sclerosis in Washington, DC. And I was able to sponsor her, my wife and I, we walked with her. She got a community of people 
whom she worked with, people who she worked out with from a group called Kaza She. And they're all athletes and they do crazy dance moves. But they said, we're going to join you because we were, we're part of your community. We want to be part of your family. The banner behind says Kaza She, K-A-Z-A-X-E. My daughter Andrew is in the front row, second right with the orange band around her head. Her boyfriend Roland is in the back holding the flag. And when she told him she's got MS, it, she could end up in a wheelchair. She told me I wanted to give, my, give him a reason to leave if he wanted to. And he said, listen, if you end up in a wheelchair, I'll push you wherever you want to go. Keep that man. And they walked that day and the rains came. But they walked anyway in the rain. They put rain coverings on. They had a tent, umbrellas. And her goal was to raise $2,000 for multiple sclerosis research. Now, here is where the bridge between community and family became real for me. I told my friends about this walk for MS. One of my friends, I told, is Lourdes Ortiz from California. You have no idea who Lourdes Ortiz is. But I'll tell you, Lourdes Ortiz is a client of mine and a Toastmaster in California, about 3,000 miles from where we are on the East Coast. And Lourdes heard about my daughter's multiple sclerosis. She heard about my daughter having to walk to raise money for research for this very difficult condition. And she said, I will walk with your daughter and I will support her. This is how you build bonds beyond borders in Toastmasters. That's the heart I receive. That's the way my spirit is touched by my fellow Toastmasters who say, I will lock arms with you. I will bond with you. I will walk with you, even though we're so far apart. And I've been blessed in that people like you I've met in, the, in my travels on five continents who have also, in their hearts, walked with me encouraged me, bonded with me, and built relationships with me, my wife, and my family, because that's what it means to take the Toastmaster spirit and build bonds beyond borders. And by the way, my daughter did not raise $2,000 that day. She, rose, she raised $9,000, four and a half times the amount she planned to raise. And part of her success was Lourdes Ortiz a fellow Toastmaster in a different part of the country who said, I will walk with you. District 20 Toastmasters from Bahrain and Kuwait and Iraq and Egypt, you need to say, I will walk with you. Make these bonds beyond borders real and meaningful to each of you. Get to know each other. Understand your, your heart, your passion, your desire to, to grow as individuals, but also help others to grow as well. Because when you bridge that gap between Toastmasters, community, and family, it'll make all the difference. And when you work together, and encourage each other and lift each other. You have no idea what you can do for each other. Allow me to clarify what it means by that. Walking with you, you want family to walk with you. But if you treat each other as family, you will walk together. A quick story about one of my walks. One of my walks took place in 1995 when I was competing in the Toastmasters World Championship for the second time. When the contest was over, as you all know, I was named the world champion. You get that. I can recall being on that stage that day with my wife, my three children. My daughter, Andrine, was holding my trophy, and I have no idea why my face looks like that. It's the only face I have, and they caught me in that moment in 1995. We had left New York and traveled all the way across the country to California for the contest. I had won it, and my princess, Andrine, handed me a greeting card sealed in an envelope at the end of the contest. It was busy. I couldn't look at the card. We finally got back to our hotel room, and I was undressing to go to the pool. I pulled the card out of my pocket. I unsealed the envelope, which said to Daddy. I unsealed it. There were no paper cuts, so it's okay. I pulled this greeting card out, and it said, Congratulations, Daddy. We knew you could win. We knew you would win. 
My daughter signed it. My son signed it. And David, the baby, just kind of scrawled. I said, honey, look at what the kids did. They got me this beautiful card. She said, baby, you don't understand what happened. I said, yes, I do. The kids got me a card. They love me. They're proud of me. She said, be quiet and listen for a second, please. And when your wife says, be quiet, I say, okay. She said, honey, the kids looked for that card. They found that card. They bought that card with your money. <laughs> they signed the card. They put it in the envelope. They sealed the envelope before we left New York to come to California. Because that, honey, is how much your kids and your team believe in you. What? We have no idea what we can accomplish with the support of those who believe in us when we build those bonds locally and beyond the borders. And if we treat each other as family, that's what we do. Now, my kids, Andrine, Joel, and David are not here. Not here. They've all moved on to different parts of the world, and they live in different states now, one in California, one in Maryland, and one in uh, Virginia. But you know what? If they were here, I probably would say one thing to them, and it's this. <clears throat> Did you ever know that you're my hero? And everything I would like to be. Now I can fly higher than an eagle. You are the wind beneath my wings. When we choose to bond together, lock arms together, and build those bonds beyond borders, what happens is we become the wind beneath each other's wings. We become almost a family to them, to each other. Here is my biggest team, my family, very quickly. On the left, my son, Joel, 35, he's in D.C. On the right, next to my wife, is David. He's 27 in California. My wife, Andrea, in that beautiful blue dress. And in the middle are Andrine and Roland, who eventually married her, even though he knew she may end up in a wheelchair. She's not. They're happily married. And I'm pleased to say that I was the one who did a ceremony. And they're now married with me as the officiant. Here's my team, my family team. But I tell you what, I believe we're all part of a Toastmasters team. And like ants who get together, who bond together to overcome every obstacle, including COVID. Like a team that sees new and improving and growing members who are welcome into the family, like Iraq and Egypt. When we bond together beyond the borders of our belief system, beyond the borders of our country, beyond the borders of our faith or religion, when we bond together as Toastmasters, as community, and as family, then we can be stronger together when we build bonds beyond the borders. To you all, I wish success. I wish blessings. I wish every good thing. I wish for you to grow together as community and as family. And may we all continue to be examples to the world of what we can do and who we can be as we build bonds beyond the borders. It is my joy, my honor, my privilege, and my blessing serving you. And I want to give you a, a short, a, a very small gift, a small gift called the Unforgettable Presentations Podcast. It is a podcast that I do. It's free, and I have tools and tips for anybody who wants to be a better speaker. So here's the idea. Scan that QR code and get our free podcast. It's every week we, we, we put a podcast out to help you to be a better presenter. Why? When you are better presenters, you can lift and encourage each other. You can be stronger together. You can build greater bonds together. When we do that, we become family because we're building lasting relationships. Take care of yourselves, take care of each other. I ask you to dream big, work bigger, work together and make this an outstanding day. Blessings to you all, District 20. Shukran.
dear Mark, thank you very much for your speech. A, a speech truly fit for a world champion. Stronger together. Could your presentation be any more representative of our, of our theme? And talking about our example, our district, and Egypt and Iraq joining it, I really, really felt involved. And I can tell that you've said the theme of the day more than any of us today. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, I can see also in, in the chat box, a lot of people uh, sending their, uh, uh, their love and uh, their prayers to you and to your family. Thank you all for entertaining and informing us today. Thanks for a great speech. And now before we move on, let's introduce the certificate of participation to our keynote speaker, E.M. Mark Brown. Thank you. And now, continuing on, continuing on with serious talk and education, I am actually trying to keep a serious face as we're talking education. Very serious, serious, yes, serious. And now, let's move on to our next presentation and our next speaker. She is a professional speaker, trainer, and advocate. Her ongoing work as an advocate for empathy has brought her to schools in California, England, Saudi Arabia, churches, synagogues, on TEDx, Al Jazeera's AJ+, in local newspapers, on local TV, radio, podcasts, a feature in Forbes magazine, Muslims of America, and a cover story in Toastmasters magazine. In 2012, she was named one of the top 30 public speakers of the world by Toastmasters International. In 2021, the organization honored her on International Women's Day as one of the five most inspiration females along female icons such as USA's young, youngest inaugural poet, Amanda Gorman, and Guinness World Record endurance kayaker, Robin Benincasa. In 2022, Inside Edge Foundation for Education selected her as one of the most excellent and illuminating speakers alongside eminent figures such as American developmental biologist and author, Bruce Lipton, author, humorist, political and cultural commentator, Steve Barman, author and spiritual visionary, Penny Pierce, and executive storyteller and leadership coach, Michael Gabriel. She has presented keynotes and workshops for organizations in the US, Middle East, and India, such as the Inside Edge, Bank of America, the Bank of New York, Mellon Corp, Hult Prize United Nations Turkey, Discover Islam Bahrain, Ford India, Infosys, and more. She is the co-author of Hidi Lee's Sexy with No Boundaries. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome our keynote speaker, DTM Khan, with her presentation entitled, Move In. DTM Sara, yep. it's all yours. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. <laughs> it is such an incredible honor and a pleasure to be here amongst you all. And thank you so much for the gracious introduction, Dalia. And a very special thank you to my beloved brother Khalid for inviting me to be a part of such an auspicious event titled Bond Beyond Borders. By the way, guys, uh, our Bahraini James Bond, brother Khalid, he truly exemplifies bonding beyond borders as even though we communicated for the very first time just a month ago, I feel like I've known him forever. <laughs> so, you know, your theme resonates with me deeply because as a peacemonger, I'm passionate about forging bonds by building bridges of understanding between different races and religions and ethnicities. You know, within Toastmasters, guys, we are all peacemongers, aren't we? 
right? Because whether you want to become an impactful speaker or an effective leader, building bonds beyond physical and mental boundaries, it requires you to be both receptive and respectful of difference, especially difference of opinion, isn't it? But to what extent are we able to do that when we step outside of the world of Toastmasters? That's what we need to ask ourselves. So today, through my personal stories, I'm going to reveal to you what it takes to forge bonds in the real world, even beyond bitter borders. So, you know, guys, a few years ago, I was invited to give a keynote at a private Jewish high school. And when I stepped on stage, I sensed like an eerie atmosphere in the hall. Now I knew that I needed to break the ice, otherwise I wouldn't be able to connect with the Jewish kids. So I started my talk with a question. I just came up with a question right then. So I'm like, um, can anyone guess where am I originally from? Now, there were a bunch of boys all the way, standing all the way in the end, and they yelled, Palestine! And then they started chuckling. And then there was pin drop silence. Now you could tell that the teachers were upset by that remark. And then I replied, well, originally I'm from my mother's uterus, but my birth certificate says India. And then everyone burst into a laughter and I connected instantly. So, you know, speaking of my origin, I've been in the United States for nearly three decades and I consider Chicago to be my hometown, town, but I still consider myself a Bombayite as India is my birth country. Now, you know, whenever I watch the news, whether it be Indian or American news, all I hear about is social unrest, global tension or acts of terror, angry hands clenched into angry fists, pounding at each other like war drums. And each side perceives themselves to be the warrior, whereas the other the enemy. It feels like we're living in an ideological combat zone, right? Our differences are intensifying and polarization is tearing the seams of society. And this isn't just an Indian or an American illness. This is a global pandemic, as evident with all of the conflicts that we see around us today. Now, one of my favorite social scientists once said, people are hard to hate close up, so move in. You know, as a peacemonger, whenever I give talks on the importance of forging bonds, I always include stories from my childhood. Now, you should see the way people stare at me with wide eyes when I tell them that I was born in a Hindu country, India, raised as a Muslim in a conservative Islamic household. And since the age of three, I studied under nuns in an all-girls Catholic convent. Yep, sounds like a formula for spontaneous combustion. But you know, in reality, guys, it equipped me with the ability to empathize with those on the opposite ends of my ideological spectrum. Now, I remember um, every morning um, when I was a little girl, I would wake up at the crack of dawn and then I'd lay my little prayer rug down and then say, Allahu Akbar, and then start praying. And then at school, we would all march our way to the church where the nuns and the priest would start the morning prayers within the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit in. Now, my favorite part was, um, you know, after mass, when they'd pass around that wafer dipped in holy water. Has anyone ever tried that? Hmm? So if you have, you know that it has no taste, right? But the mere joy that came from sharing it with my Catholic friends made its taste as sweet as paradise. Now, since all of my neighbors were Hindus, my favorite trips with them would be to the temple. Now, I remember as a tiny girl, I would have to jump to ring those temple bells. Thankfully, as an adult, I won't have to jump anymore. I'd use a step stool because I'm vertically challenged. Now, all those who've seen me in uh, real life can validate. 
And, you know, and then we'd all join our hands and we'd bow our head in prayer and then wait for the temple priest to distribute those mouth-watering Indian sweets called mithai. Now, I remember this one time we had a potluck, okay? And um, Annie, my Catholic friend, she brought pork chops. And I was like, swine? Referring to the chops, okay? Not to Annie. Whereas Preeti, my Hindu friend, she looked at my beef kebabs and yelled, holy cow! So, you know, even though we nourished ourselves with different food and wisdom, because we had moved in, we not only tolerated, but celebrated our differences. Now, my last memories of India were the Bombay riots that followed the Babri Mosque demolition. Now, being a little girl, I was oblivious to how religions can be exploited, how they can be manipulated and leveraged for political gain. Now, when we become too attached to an ideology, whether it be political or religious, we leave no room for nuance. You're either with us or you're against us. We become desensitized, unable to feel with the heart of another. Now, what we don't realize is that both sides' perspective is their only reality. I repeat, both sides' perspective is their only reality. So their truth is as self-evident to them as ours is to us. Now, you know, what I'll always remember about the Bombay riots is that our Hindu neighbors risked their lives to protect us against the Hindu mobs that went door to door looking to kill Muslims. Because our neighbors had moved in, because they had gotten to know us, they were able to understand our perspective and empathize with our vulnerable situation. And had we not moved in, we wouldn't have trusted them with our lives knowing that they belonged to the same religion as the Moraders who wanted to kill us. forging bonds by coming closer and embracing our shared humanity. That had been my only experience in India. And then in the early 90s, my family and I moved to America in pursuit of the American dream. Now, I don't mean owning a 7-Eleven. But you know, 9-11 changed everything for me. On September 11th, 2001, when America came under attack, fear gripped our country and doubts became justified. Now people started questioning not only the nation's security and their personal safety, but also the loyalty of fellow Americans of Muslim faith. And as the nation succumbed to Islamophobia, Muslims became victims of hate, of prejudice and violence. Tell me something, guys. Have you ever been judged? Hmm? Have you ever been uh, treated differently? Or have you ever been criticized based on how you look, based on how you sound or where you're from? Hmm? Now, imagine being bullied in public because of your physical appearance and their ignorance. Now, I've had random people yell profanities at me at malls. I've had parents fearfully pull their kids away from my nut stores. I've been told, get out of my country, you camel jockey. And that's horrible, you know? Not only because it's hateful, but also because in India, we ride elephants, not camels, right? But you know, after enduring countless Islamophobic attacks, and uh, including almost being run over by a woman in her white SUV while I was holding my infant in my arm and had my toddler by my side, I withdrew into a shell and developed a phobia of white Americans. Now that social phobia eventually turned into agoraphobia. I couldn't leave my house. Now I remember this one time, it was a weekend and uh, my husband was out of town. 
And I realized at night that I had run out of milk. Now I couldn't step out of my room, let alone my house from fear of the hatred that lurked outside. So I just sat there all night, holding one kid in each arm, tears streaming down my eyes, watching them as they cried themselves to sleep, hungry. I was falling apart. But I, what I didn't realize was that just as many Americans have generalized about all Muslims being terrorists, which led to Islamophobic attacks against us, I had started to generalize about all Americans being Islamophobes. Now that perception didn't change until after I entered intensive therapy. Now, um, during our group therapy sessions, I was surrounded by white Americans. Now, you know, every morning, um, all of the patients of various anxiety disorders would sit in a circle in this large room, okay? To my right was Mr. OCD, to my left, Miss PTSD, and as for me, Miss Congeniality. I'm kidding. I actually held two titles, Miss Social Anxiety Disorder and Miss Agoraphobia. Now, our first exposure therapy exercise would be to introduce ourselves to the class. So, you know, the whole drill that starts with, hello, my name is, right? Have you guys ever had anxiety over the fear of having anxiety? <laughs> All of you are Toastmasters members and contestants, right? Well, guys, believe it or not, my anxiety was so intense that when my turn came to introduce myself, I couldn't even remember my name. How the hot flush of embarrassment I felt could have easily been avoided with a name tag. Isn't it? But slowly I started to feel safe and opened up. And, you know, as we got closer and as we shared our deepest fears, our adversities and vulnerabilities, we realized that we all cry tears. We all bleed red. Now, my therapist, Joanne, uh, she was blonde and blue-eyed. And, you know, she looked very similar in stature as the lady in the parking lot who almost ran me over. But whenever I shared my Islamophobic experiences with her, Joanne would get all teary-eyed and she'd offer to hug me. And as I forged a bond with the people I feared, my walls fell down and we built bridges of understanding through empathy. Now, after stepping out of therapy, I stepped into Toastmasters. And when I joined, I was assigned a Jewish mentor named Holly. Now, Holly and I formed a beautiful friendship. But you know, every now and then I would wonder, what does she think of me? Not as a friend, not even as a mentee, but as a Muslim. And then one day Holly said to me, while I'll never bear children, you, you have filled that void in my life. You know, guys, we still, we did have our differences. Now, she'd weep for her loved ones in Israel and I would for mine in Palestine. Yet our hearts were always intertwined like the messages of our holy scriptures. People are hard to hate close up. When you move in, you have the opportunity to hear stories that otherwise you would have never been able to hear. Stories about how innocent people get dragged into ideological wars and are left with nothing but broken windows, broken bones, and broken families. Now, when I started, uh, when I joined stand-up comedy, I met Gordon, my very first atheist friend. Now, even though we seemed worlds apart, 
we transcended our differences and bonded with humor and hummus. By the way, guys, the best way to move in is to break bread with strangers because they are bound to become your friends after that as the way to the heart is through the stomach. Mm. Now, you know, one time Gordon posted a picture of us on Facebook with a caption, my favorite Muslim, to which I replied, dude, I am the only Muslim you know. Peace in pluralism and unity in diversity. That's the beauty of humanity. You know, today, the news media or the politicians who tend to dominate the air, uh, airwaves, they use dehumanization to divide people and to promote hate. Dehumanization demonizes those perceived as enemy by using words and images that portray them as morally degenerate. Now, I'm a Muslim of Kashmiri descent and I'm well aware of their struggle for human dignity and self-determination. And yet having distant relatives in the Indian military, I grew up listening to heartfelt stories about the sacrifices they made for their country. And as an Indian married to a Pakistani, I've heard similar stories of sacrifice by my husband's relatives who served in the Pakistani military. So I've had the unique opportunity to hear both sides of the story. Empathy can be a radical force for transformation. I've listened to the hurt and I've been moved to tears by cries on both sides. And more importantly, I've come to understand that we all share the same hopes the same dreams, the same love of country, and the same willingness to sacrifice to protect our people. Now, did you guys know that um, when uh, Gandhi witnessed the conflict between Hindus and Muslims leading to the India's Independence Day, he declared, I am a Muslim and a Hindu and a Christian and a Jew. Does anybody have anything to contribute amongst the audience members because your mic is on? Thank you. So from the comfort of our living room, you know, based on the information that we receive from the news, it's very easy to decide what a fate of a people should be, what's best for them. But how can we render judgment without listening to their stories? Huh? Now today, whenever I watch the news, do you know what I see? And the name of ideologies, leaders, weaponizing terminologies, that's what I see. In those angry fists, all I see are welted fingers. Through those broken windows, those broken bones, all I see are broken hearts. As a hijabi with such a diverse background, I may be easy to hate, especially in today's political climate, unless, of course, people are willing to move in and get to know me. And that is why, guys, not just in Toastmasters, but also outside the world of Toastmasters, we must break bread with strangers, especially get to know those on the opposite ends of our ideological spectrum and let go of the attitude that for me to be right, I must prove you to be wrong. Arguments may win debates, but will never win hearts. So my dear brothers and sisters in humanity, I implore you to become peacemongers in the real world. As embracing our differences while recognizing our shared humanity is the only way to forge bonds and foster peace in a turbulent world. So move in as people are hard to hate close up. Over to you, Dalia. 
Titi, I'm sorry. Thank you very much for your speech. After hearing the list of all of your achievements, I was really looking forward to hearing you speak. And to be honest, you live up to your reputation. As an MC, I usually have a hard time. I'm too distracted and too anxious. I don't usually listen to speeches or people talk. But to your speech, I actually listened to all of it, almost. And the one thing that I can say has really, really touched me is the fact that you don't only express with your words, but everything that you say is also expressed in your face. And I could tell that you really feel everything that you're saying. So congratulations, more than great speech. Now, let me introduce a certificate of participation to our keynote speaker, DTM Sara Khan. Thank you so much, Lord Dahlia. Thank you for the generous compliments. And uh, so much, everybody. It's been such an incredible pleasure. Thank you. As you can see in the comments, you have all the great comments from coming from everyone. I'm just about to read the comments. There. Yes. <laughs> everyone was touched and everyone loved your speech. Thank you very much again. OK. We're a bit early, however. It's time for us to take a break. So let's do that. Let's go on, on our, no, not paper. No, we'll continue, sorry. We'll continue with- um, Next one. speaker is here already, yes. Okay, okay. Then let's move on. And this time, it's the time we listen to the Arabic program. دلوقتي هنكون مع الفقرة اللي كل المتكلمين بالعربي في انتظارهم من بداية. أنا بس بقول ما فيش أي ضغط على على المتحدث القادم لكن خلوني في البداية أقدم لكم التوس ماستر المتميز اللي هيقدم لنا البرنامج التعليمي القادم اللي هيكون باللغة العربية هو مهندس استشاري متقاعد وتوس ماستر متميز من المملكة العربية السعودية التحقوا بالتوس ماسترز عام 2005 وله العديد من الإنجازات فقد فاز ببطولة الخطبة الفكاهية للقطاع 79 ست مرات أيوة ست مرات وده رقم قياسي غير مسبوق وفاز أيضا في مسابقات عديدة ومتنوعة أخرى باللغتين العربية والإنجليزية ومن ضمنها فوزه مرتين بالمركز الثاني في المسابقات العالمية للقطاع 79 قدم الكثير من المحاضرات وورش العمل في كثير من المؤتمرات في مجاله المهني وفي التوست ماسترز ومن ضمنها ورشة عمل في المؤتمر السنوي لمنطقة التوست ماسترز العالمية المقام في لاس فيجاس عام 2011 بإمكانكم متابعته على حسابه على الفيسبوك واليوتيوب والتيك توك. رحبوا معايا بالتوست ماستر المتميز محمد عبد الله العيسى وورشة بعنوان كيف تعد خطبة عالمية مؤثرة وجديرة بالفوز. توست ماستر محمد المنصة لك. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أنا سعيد جدا بانضمامي لكم في هذا المؤتمر وأتمنى أن تسمعون صوتي بوضوح الآن أتمنى فقط إعطائي الكوهوست حتى أتمكن من مشاركة العرض شكرا تي أم تحيلة فر هذه المقدمة الله يعطيك العافية الكريمة Vikarudin, uh, can you please give our speaker co-host and maybe also, yes, thank you.
You're muted, uh, Brother Fischer. Uh, yes, you can have it. I just. His video is. Yeah, now his video is on. Have one. Uh... Let him co host, yeah. yeah. Thank you. تسمعونني؟ جيدا نعم شكرا لكم موضوعنا لهذا اليوم هو عن إعداد خطبة عالمية جديرة بالفوز ومؤثرة هذه الفقره او هذه برشه العمل هذه يستطيع ان يستفيد منها اي عضو توست ماستر يرغب في الفوز في مسابقات الخطبه العالميه وهي ايضا مفيده لكل انسان يرغب في معرفه اسرار الخطابه المؤثره والملهمه ما هي الخطبه العالميه الخطبة العالمية هي رسالة صالحة لجمهور عالمي في جميع البلدان بغض النظر عن لغاتهم وأديانهم وأعراقهم هي خطبة إنسانية صالحة للجميع تستطيع أن تعتبر أن جمهورك أنت كخطيب هو سكان العالم سكان الكرة الأرضية وهي تحتوي على رسالة قيمة تريد أن تصلها إلى هذا الجمهور العالم ولكن هي رسالة قيمة وفي نفس الوقت توصل للجمهور بكفاءة عالية وما الذي نقصده عندما نقول أن هذه الرسالة توصل بكفاءة عالية أولا هي سهلة الاستيعاب يعني كل من يسمعها يستوعب الرسالة وتصله الرسالة بدقة وفي ذات الوقت هي شديدة الإقناع لأن الرسالة هذه في العادة أنت إما تريد بها أن تحفز إنسان على القيام بشيء ما أو تغير رأيه عن شيء ما أو تلفت انتباهه إلى حاجة ماسة يحتاجها في حياته فلا بد أن تكون قادر على إقناع جمهورك وصعبة النسيان صعبة النسيان أقصد أن من يسمعها لا ينساها بسرعة تظل عالقة في ذهنه لسنوات طويلة والسبب أنه حين الإصغاء لها كان متأثرا بواسطة قدرات الخطيب وبمحتوى الرسالة ذاتها التحدي الأكبر أنك يجب أن تؤدي كل هذه الأشياء في مدة قدرها سبع دقائق فقط كيف تقوم بإيصال رسالة قيمة وبكفاءة عالية لجمهور عالمي في وقت مدته سبع دقائق فقط وهنا يأتي سحر التوست ماستر سوف نتكلم هذه الليلة عن محورين فقط مواصفات الخطبة العالمية الجديرة بالفوز وخطوات إعداد الخطبة العالمية مواصفات الخطبة العالمية هي متعددة ويجد الخطيب نفسه أمام تحدي بحيث يجب عليه أن يحقق كل هذه الشروط بدقة وبتوازن ففي الحقيقة إعداد خطبة عالمية هي عملية تحتاج إلى الكثير من التفكير والكثير من التمرن والكثير من المهارة لكي يحقق الإنسان كل شروط نجاحها وتأثيرها ما هي مواصفات الخطبة العالمية الجديرة بالفوز؟ طبعا هنا عندنا ثلاث عناصر أنت كخطيب 
ورسالتك وجمهورك هناك مواصفات يجب أن تتصف بها أنت وهناك مواصفات يجب أن تتصف بها رسالتك وهناك صفات يجب أن يتصف بها جمهورك دائما لابد أن تضع في ذهنك أن جمهورك سوف يتساءل في بداية الاستماع لك What's in it for me مثل ما يقولون ما هو نصيبي من كل هذا ما الذي سأستفيد أنا في حياتي من هذه اللحظات التي أقضيها مستمعا لهذا الخطيب أو المتحدث إذا يجب أن يكون اهتمامك منصبا على إفادة جمهورك منذ بداية تخطيطك لإعداد الخطبة جمهورك هو رقم واحد أن يستفيد جمهورك هو الأولوية الكبرى في إعداد أي خطبة كيف يجب أن تنظر إلى جمهورك أو كيف ينبغي أن تنظر إلى جمهورك جمهورك يجب أن تضع في ذهنك عدة أمور أنهم أناس مثلك يواجهون مشاكل وتحديات وعندهم آمال وآلام وطموح في هذه الحياة ويبحثون بشغف عن طرق لمواجهة المشاكل والتحديات ولتحقيق الآمال والطموح ويأملون أن يجدون عندك بعض هذه الحلول لتخفيف بعض آلامهم أو لتحقيق بعض آمالهم ورسالتك يجب أن تؤدي هذا الدور أنت لا بد أن تقدم نفسك لجمهورك على أنك إنسان عادي وليس إنسان سوبرمان لا بد أن تقدم نفسك لجمهورك على أنك مثلهم ضعيف يصيبك ما يصيبهم من الضعف ومن الوهن ومن الانكسار وأنك مثلهم عندك أمال وطموح ومشاكل لا تقدم نفسك على أنك سوبرمان وأنت جاي تفتخر بقوتك لأنك بهذا تحبط جمهورك وأنت باختصار في رسالتك العالمية سوف بتقول لهم شيء واحد أنني أنا تعلمت كإنسان ضعيف مثلكم درسا مهما في هذه الحياة وغير في حياتي هذا الدرس وسوف أشاركه معكم هذا أو في هذه الخطبة إذا رسالتك يجب أن تكون درس تعلمته من الحياة ولكن هناك مواصفات لابد أن تتصف بها هذه الرسالة الرسالة يجب أن تكون بسيطة لا تشعب ولا تعقد في رسالتك اجعلها بسيطة و كيف تعرف أنها بسيطة؟ إذا كنت قادراً على اختصارها في أقل من عشر كلمات فرسالتك بسيطة وواضحة عندك إذا احتجت لأكثر من عشر كلمات فهي إما رسالة متشعبة معقدة لا تستطيع أن توصلها بكفاءة في سبع دقائق أم أنها ليست واضحة في ذهنك وإذا لم تكن واضحة في ذهنك فلن تكون واضحة عند جمهورك أبداً أكثر من اتضاحها لك إذا لابد أن يكون بسيط الرسالة بسيطة وواضحة جدا عنده وأن تكون ذات صلة بما يهم الناس اختر شيء متعلق بأمور حياتية للناس بمشاعرهم بآمالهم بعقولهم بمعاناتهم لا تختار موضوعا لا يهم الا فئه قليله من الناس او فئه متخصصه فهذه ليست خطبه عالميه ويجب ان يكون ان تكون رسالتك مقبوله لا تثير الجدل هناك رسالات بطبعها مثيره للجدل فان رضى عنها ناس سخط عليها اخر تجنب هذه المواضيع في خطبك العالميه لانك لن تفوز سوف يكون بعض الحكام ممن لا يتبنون هذا الرأي أو يعترضون على هذا الرأي وهم بشر طبعا سوف يتأثرون 
إذا اختر المواضيع التي تهم جميع الناس بغض النظر عن أديانهم ولغاتهم وأعراقهم وتخصصاتهم والتي هي مقبولة عند الجميع يعني تأمل أن كل الكل راح يتفق معك إذا أخبرت بهذه الرسالة ولا تعطيهم أشياء غير قابلة للتطبيق دائما رسالتك في النهاية قابلة للتطبيق يعني يستطيع جمهورك بعد أن يعود للبيت أن يبدأ في تطبيق هذه الرسالة ويجب أن تكون مهمة يعني تتناول جانب مهم وليس ثانوي أو غير مهم في حياتك ويجب أن تكون الرسالة أصيلة وأصلية هناك مواضيع مطروقة كثيرا الناس شبعت وملت منها وليس فيها من جديد الرسالة المؤثرة هي التي نسميها يعني مكالمة إيقاف يعني ويك اب كول لما يسمعها الإنسان كأن كأنك أيقظت من نومه كأن أول مرة يسمع بهذا الشيء أو يعرف بهذه الحقيقة وأحيانا تستطيع أن تطرق موضوعا مستهلكا ولكن اجعل طريقتك إبداعية في تقديمه فلتكن طريقتك أصيلة من حيث الإبداع في طريقة طرح هذه الرسالة ويجب أن يكون الموضوع لا ينسى ولكي تثبت أي موضوع في أذهان الجمهور فأنت تحتاج إلى حبكة درامية حبكة في جزء من خطبتك تسيطر عاطفيا على الجمهور وتؤثرهم وتحرك مشاعرهم كلهم كلهم يشعرون بمعاناتك أو بالقصة والمشاعر التي في هذه القصة وليست بالضرورة أن تكون درامية دراما محزنة أنت أيضا تستطيع أن تستخدم الفكاهة وفي السنوات الأخيرة أكثر الخطب العالمية الفائزة هي التي لعبت الفكاهة دور فيها في تثبيت الرسالة وليس الحزن والدموع وللأسف هناك يعني فئة كبيرة من 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 التوست ماسترز عندهم هذا الانطباع الخاطئ بأن لا بد أن يبكي الجمهور ويحزنهم لكي يفوز في الخطبة العالمية هذا خطأ أهم شيء أن يكون مؤثر وفي حبكة درامية أو فكاهية معزز معزز يعني الأثر الكلي لرسالتك يجب أن ترفع معنويات الناس وأمالهم الأثر الكلي بعد أن توصل رسالتك أنت تعطي للناس وللجمهور أمل في الحياة لا تنهي خطبتك بإحباط الناس بإعطائهم مشكلة غير قابلة للحل أو ب يعني بتسويد الحياه في في وجوههم وانظارهم. لابد ان يكون الاثر الكلي لرسالتك ايجابي. هذه هي مواصفات الرساله ذاتها. طيب هناك مواصفات يجب ان تكون لعلاقتك برسالتك. انت كخطيب يجب ان تقنع جمهورك بأنك تتصف بهذه المواصفات بالنسبة لرسالتك ما هي علاقتك أنت بالرسالة وهناك أيضا مواصفات تربطك أنت بجمهورك لابد أن تكون قادر على أقناع جمهورك بأنك تملك هذه المواصفات ما هي تلك المواصفات بينك وبين رسالتك أولا لابد أنك تكون صادق وأثنتك في الرسالة اللي توصلها يعني تكون أنت أكثر إنسان مقتنع فيها قبل أن تحاول أن تقنع الآخرين جدير كريدبل من أنت حتى تتكلم عن هذا الموضوع من أنت متى تكون أجدر الناس بالكلام عن الموضوع متى تكون جديرا أنا مهندس ميكانيكي وأتطرق إلى موضوع في اللغة العربية مثلا أنا فيزيائي وأتطرق للموضوع في الأحياء الناس هنا تشكك في جدارتك عندما تتكلم في تخصصك كن جدارتك عالية 
عندما تتكلم عن موضوع أنت بحثت فيه يعني بحث قدمته وقضيت فيه الساعات الكثيرة والجهد الكثير تكون جدير وأجدر ما تكون عليه ما هو عندما تتكلم عن تجاربك الشخصية وقصصك الشخصية لا أحد يشكك في عواطفك عندما تمر بحالة فرح أو حزن عندما تمر و دائما الخطب العالميه الناجحه لا تخلو من قصه شخصيه للانسان. طبعا في خطب عالميه يستعير فيها الخطيب قصص اخرى لاناس اخرين قريبين من اصدقاء او افراد من العائله. بس الاكثر تاثيرا لما تكون انت قصتك الشخصيه. شغوف انت لابد ان تكون شغوف حول رسالتك. يعني وانت تعرف متى تكون شغوف تحس ان السبع دقائق غير كافيه انك تتكلم ودك تتكلم نص ساعه ساعه مليء باشياء كثيره ودك تقول عندك شغف بالكلام اما ان تتكلم ببرود عن الموضوع فكيف تريد جمهورك ان يتاثر؟ طيب هذه بالنسبه للعلاقه اللي تحكمك بين تحكم صفتك برسالتك ما هي الصفات التي بينك أنت وبين جمهورك؟ أولاً يجب أن تقنعهم بأنك إنسان متواضع ومهتم لا تقدم نفسك على أنك سوبرمان تتفاخر عليهم وتتعالى عليهم أنت مثلهم ومهتم بإيصال هذه الرسالة لأنك مقتنع أنها إن شاء الله تفيدهم في حياتهم في مقولة جيدة بالإنجليزي تقول I don't care how much you know until I know how much you care. لا يهمني مقدار معرفتك حتى اعرف مقدار اهتمامك. فانت قدم نفسك اقنع جمهورك انك متواضع ومهتم ومخلص مخلص انت هنا على المسرح وخلف المنصه ليس لتبدو لهم نجما ساطعا ولتبرز مهاراتك أنت هنا لتوصل رسالة بصدق وإخلاص العالم الجهوزية يب... لا بد أن تكون جاهز وبالذات في الخطب العالمية في المسابقات جمهورك لن يقبل خطيب أن غير جاهز غير واضح الأفكار والكلمات والجمل والأداء لن تفوز في خطبة عالمية إذا حس الجمهور ولجنة الحكام أنك غير مستعد وغير جاهز لإلقاء خطبتك من خلال مسيرتي في التوست ماستر رأيت هناك متسابقين يستهترون بالإعداد للخطب العالمية ويحاولون أن يعدوها في في قبل يومين أو أسبوع من موعد المسابقة الكلام هذا لا يصلح ممكن أن تتشارك وبالحظ تفوز ولكن إذا أردت أن تحرز يعني مراكز متقدمة فلا بد أن تعد للموضوع قبل وقت كافي بالنسبة لي والتجربتي أنا طبعا رغم أني يعني تخصصت في الخطابة الفكاهية ولا الحمد لله وفقني للفوز إلا أني كنت دائما أطمح في الفوز بالخطبة العالمية ولله الحمد يعني فزت مرتين بالمركز الثاني على مستوى القطاع 79 وكنت قريب يعني من فوز بمسابقه القطاع في عام 2009 شاركت بخطبه عنوانها النقطه العمياء والان اقابل ناس لا زالوا يتذكرونها الى الان طبعا من ضمن الفقره هذه راح اقدم لكم هذه الفقره هي موجوده على اليوتيوب بس إذا تسمحون لي أشاركها الآن معاكم لنستمع لها وبعدين نعود نختم الـ الـ إذا بس قبل أن أستعرضها لكم خل نقول خطوات إعداد الخطبة العالمية أول خطوة تبحث في حياتك عن درس تعلمته وأثر على حياتك إيجابا ويستحق أن يعرفه الآخرون لأنه يمكن أن يؤثر على حياتهم بنفس الطريقة الإيجابية ابحث وكل واحد فينا مليء بالقصص مليء بالقصص 
التي تستحق أن يشاركها مع الآخرين وأن يستنتج منها الدروس والعبر فقط أنت تحتاج إلى أن تقف مع نفسك وتسترجع شريط حياتك وصدقني سوف طيب كيف تعرف النقاط في حياتك التي تعلمت منها الدروس ابحث عن تلك اللحظات التي تحركت فيها عواطفك تعرضت لصدمة تعرضت لحزن شديد لفرح شديد لإحباط شديد لحظات الفرح والحزن يحدث بعدها تأمل كثير يبدأ الإنسان يفكر يفكر ريفلكتنج على التجربة اللي صارت له هذه اللحظة اللي يتعلم منها الدروس وهذه اللحظات اللي ممكن ترجع لها في حياتك وتستفيد منها الدروس إذا أنت في حياة كل واحد منا هناك العشرات والمئات من الدروس ما الذي أختار من هذه الدروس لكي أجعله مادة لخطبة عالمية مثل ما قلنا ابحث عن أشدها تأثيرا فيك والذي يتميز بهذه الصفات هي ذلك الدرس البسيط والواضح وذو صلة يعني ريليفنت للناس ومقبول عندهم وقابل للتطبيق ومهم في حياتهم وأصلي ولا ينسى ومعزز بصفة عامة إذا تختار منها فابحث عن ذلك الدرس وحاول أن أن الخطوة الثانية أنت الدرس الآن واضح أول خطوة مهمة يسمونها الكي فريز يسميها بعض أبطال الخطابة العالمية الكي فريز الكي فريز هو تلك العبارة أو الجملة التي تلخص الرسالة كلها ويجب أن تكون أنت قادر على كتابتها في أقل من عشر كلمات إن لم تستطع كتابتها في عشر كلمات فأنت إما ليست واضحة أو أنها يعني أكبر من أن تستطيع أن تلم بها في سبع دقائق مثلا لو رجعنا للخطبة الفائزة عام 2004 لراندي هارفي بعنوان The Lessons I Learned From Fat Dad لوجدنا لو أن الكيف ريز ممكن نلخصه بهذه العبارة الحب الحقيقي هو التزام غير مشروع هذا الرسالة اللي بيوصلها وكل شيء في الخطبة كان لهدف إيصال هذه الرسالة عام 2005 لانس ميلر ذا التيميت كويستشن يعني لو حاولنا نلخص فحوى رسالته بالمديح نحن نعزز ونصادق على قدرات بعضنا البعض ما ادري انا اشوف ان احنا اقتربنا من وقت الانتهاء فهل اترك لكم يعني الرجوع الى الخطبه ولا نشوفها مع بعض هي ثمان دقائق تقريبا نشوف الخطبة مع بعض طبعا الخطوة الثانية اكتب خطبتك وحاول أن لا تتجاوز 650 إلى 800 كلمة الخطبة أنت في هالسبع دقائق شو اللي تبي تسوي أنك تبي في المقدمة هم قبل أن تبدأ خطبتك لا يدرون عما سوف تتكلم الأمر مفتوح جدا في البداية أنت تأخذهم إلى حيث تريد أن تقنعهم بهذا الدرس ثم لابد أن تقنعهم بأن هذا الدرس مهم لهم فإذا جزء من الخطبة إقناعهم بأهمية هذا الموضوع ودعم الدرس دعم الدرس بأدلة بإحصائيات بـ 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 بحبكة درامية وثبت الدرس قلنا لا يمكن تثبيت الدرس في أذهان الجمهور إلا بحبكة درامية يجب أن تكتب خطتك بطريقة تكون فيها يعني حبكة درامية تحرك فيها مشاعر الجمهور في وهذه اللحظة التي يندمج فيها الجمهور معك تصبح مشكلتك هي مشكلته ومشكلته مشكلة هي مشكلته آه ثم بين لهم كيف يمكن أن يستفيدوا من هذا الدرس طبعاً أنت الدرافت الأولي أو المسودة الأولية دائماً عندما تتمرن عليها في الأداء راح تحس أن في أشياء لا تنسجم معك مع, مع تكوينك مع تركيبتك فأنت دائماً آه 
أعد كتابة الخطبة بما يتفق مع طبيعتك مع صدقك ومشاعرك لا ترتبط ارتباطا عاطفيا ببعض الجمل لأنها جميلة بلاغيا أو إن لم تكن تخدم أحد هالأهداف إن لم تكن تساهم في إبراز الدرس أو في تدعيمه أو في تثبيته امسحها نحن هنا ليس في مسابقة للبلاغة هنا مسابقة الخطبة العالمية مسابقة في إيصال الدرس بطريقة مؤثرة ولا تنسى بعد أن يعني تكتب أكثر من مسودة وتنتهي بالمسودة الأخيرة تمرن وتمرن 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 متى تعرف أنك الآن مستعد لما تحس أنك ودك أن المسابقة الآن لا تستطيع الصبر حتى المسابقة أنت الآن جاهز ولكن طالما عندك خوف وعندك نقاط ضبابية غير عارف شو اللي راح تقول فيها وكيف راح تؤديها بما فيه حركة الجسد والحركة على المسرح فأنت غير جاهز للمسابقة في خطبة عالية أعتقد أيها الأعزاء أن الوقت داهمنا إذا تسمحون لي سبع دقائق أو ثمان دقائق نشوف هذه أو نعطيكم إياها هومورك وتشوفونها توكل على الله توكل على الله مشتاقين والله نشوف الله يسلمك انتم ترونها الان اي نعم نقطه الامياء النقطه الامياء محمد الايسا شاركني في الكفاح الصوت واضح عندكم؟ تمام السيد رئيس المسابقة لجنة الحكام الموقرة السادة الأعضاء الأخوة والأخوات الضيوف السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته والسلام ورحمة الله وبركاته ترى أيها الأخوة والأخوات هل أنتم مطلعون على مشاعر أقرب الناس إلى نفوسكم؟ آباؤكم أمهاتكم، أطفالكم، أزواجكم، أصدقاؤكم المقربون ترى هل تعرفون حقيقة مشاعرهم تجاهكم قبل أن تجاوبوا؟ هل أنتم متأكدون من ذلك؟ إننا كثيرا ما تخامرنا تلك الثقة العمياء بأننا مطلعون على مشاعرهم إلى أن نكتشف خلاف ذلك حينها نصاب بخيبة أمل ونكتشف بأننا لم نكن إلا عميانا عن حقيقة ما يشعرون وأولئك المقربون منا نشعر وكأنهم أغرابا قد اكتشفناهم للتا في يوم من الأيام كنت مسترقيا على الأريكة أشاهد التلفاز وإذا بابنتي وكان عمرها حين ذاك خمسة عشر سنة تدخل قائلة أبتي هلا ساعدتني على ايجاد جوالي فقد اضعته في محل ما ها هنا قلت لها حبا والف كرامه يا ابنتي تناولت جوالي طلبت رقمها مرت لحظات صمت مشوبه بترقب سمعنا صوتا مكبوتا ينبعث من تحت الاريكه مددت يدي والتقطت جوالها وعلت وجهينا ابتسامه الناس ما أجمل أن يجد أحدنا ظلته إنه شعور جميل ولكن ليس في كل الأحوال أحياناً تتمنى بأنك لم تكتشف الحقيقة 
وكما قال الشاعر لا تكشفن مغطى فلربما كشفت جيفا عندما وقعت عيناي على شاشة جوالها ساءني ما رأيت فزعت الاسم الذي الذي اختارته ابنتي لي اسما مريعا لم اكن اتوقعه على الاطلاق ابنتي سمتني لا لام وخمس الفات البنت التي ربيتها واغدقت عليها من عطفي وحناني كانت تشعر بانني اكبر حجر عثر في طريقها والباب الذي عليه تتحطم امالها لله كم كنت اعمى غضبت عندما اكتشفت اني كنت اعمى عن مشاعر ابنتي التي هي اقرب الناس الي اختلست النظر اليها وسالت نفسي ترى هل هذه ابنتي التي ربيتها خمسه عشر سنه ام يا ترى هل انا ذلك الاب الذي كنت اظن نفسي اياه ذلك الاب الرؤوم ولكني صرخت في وجهها غاضبا ايتها البنت المتماديه في الجحود تسمينني لا وانا الذي قلت نعم لوجودك في الحياه قالت وقد غرقت في بحر حيائها وهي تصارع الخوف والتوتر ابتاه ارجوك الا تسيء فهمي فانا احبك كثيرا وممتنه لكل شيء اعطيتنيه فقد اعطيتني كل شيء ولكن بعد لا كبيره في كل مره قلت لها لا هذا غير صحيح ربما يا ابنتي قلتها بعض الاوقات لاضع حدا لمطالبك التي لا تنتهي لكني اعطيتك كل شيء قالت ابتي ارايت ها انت فعلتها مره اخرى ابتدات بلا ثم قلت بعد الكلام المعسول قلت لها لا جدوى من الحديث معك اذهبي مضت ولكن بقي في القلب حسره وفي الذهن سؤال يتردد كيف كنت اعمى عن مشاعر ابنتي طوال هذا الوقت في صبيحه اليوم التالي كنت خلف عجله القياده في طريقي الى العمل وكان نفس السؤال يتردد في ذهني ونفس الكلمه يتردد صداها لله كم كنت اعمى 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 بهذه الاثناء كانت خلفي شاحنه كانت امامي شاحنه بطيئه اردت ان اتجاوزها رمقت المراه الخلفيه والمراه الجانبيه لاتاكد من خلو الطريق فلم يكن هناك احدا وما ان ادرت عجله القياده الا وسمعت صوت بيب افزعني واصم اذاني وارجعني الى مكاني ثم مرقت سياره كالرصاصه المنطلقه ومعها رائحة الموت تسارعت أنفاسي وقلت الحمد لله ثم الشكر لذلك البوق الذي أنقذ حياتي لكن كيف؟ كيف لم أره؟ لابد أنه كان قريبا مني وقبل أن أستفيق من ذهولي كان ذلك السائق غاضبا أبطأ قليلا ثم فتح النافذة وصرخ في وجهي ألا ترى أيها الأعمى؟ قلت أعمى قال أعمى كيف؟ أيها الإخوة والأخوات أيها الأصدقاء كلنا قد نكون عميانا عن أقرب الأشياء إلينا إذا ما وقعت فيما يسمى بالنقطة العمياء وكم وكم وارت تلك النقط العمياء من أشياء قريبة منا غرورنا كبرياؤنا نقاط ضعفنا ونقاط قوتنا والأهم من ذلك كله مشاعر أقرب الناس إلينا أرجوكم ألا تبالغوا في الثقة بأنكم مطلعون على مشاعر أقرب الناس إليكم فما الذي يدريكم لعلها كانت متوارية في نقطكم العمياء قبل أن تقولوا إننا مطلعون على مشاعرهم اسمعوا مشاعرهم من أفواههم ولكي تسمعوها لا 
لابد أن تخفض الضوضاء الناتجة من تلك الأنا المتضخمة مرة أخرى ما الذي يدريكم لعل أحب الناس إليكم كان في نقطكم العمياء سيدة حياكم الله تسمعون صوتي الان تقريبا نعم. الان انتهينا ولكن لكي نعود قليلا يعني لو حاولنا نشوف نطبق الدروس اللي شفناها على النقطه العمياء أنا بحثت في حياتي عن درس أثر فيني عن اللحظة عاطفية تأثرت فيها انصدمت فيها تعلمت درس منها فوجدت هذه القصة البسيطة التي بيني وبين ابنتي وحبكت الخطبة كلها حولها طبعا احذروا أيها الآباء فقد تكونون أجهل الناس بمشاعر أبنائكم هذا الكي فريز أو فحوى الخطبة كلها أو الدرس ومثل ما قلنا كيف في البداية كيف تقدم للدرس وتبرز الدرس وتدعم الدرس هناك طرق تقليدية المقدمة التقليدية أعزائي الجمهور في هذا اليوم سوف أتكلم عن كذا وكذا وكذا طبعا في التوست ماستر لم تعد الخطب بهذه الطريقة هنا لا يوجد ترتيب زمني في الخطبة للمقدمة وإبراز الدرس ودعم الدرس الطرق مؤخرا يعني انت تمارس الابداع في كيفيه كيف تقدم هذا الدرس بطريقه ابداعيه، قد تكون الخطبه كلها عن قصه واحده قصه شخصيه واحده. لكنها تشتمل في داخلها على هذه العناصر. اذا الخطبه العالميه هي رسالتك الى العالم وهي رساله قيمه توصل بكفاءه عاليه سهله الاستيعاب. شديدة الإقناع صعبة النسيان وشكرا لكم أيها الأعزاء أنصح بمراجعة مواصفات أو التحكيم حتى تعرف ما هي النقاط التي تركز عليها في إبراز الدرس تحياتي لكم وأشكر لكم إصغاءكم وأستميحكم العذر على تجاوز الوقت توست ماستر محمد شكرا لك على الورشه المميزه والموضوع المهم لينا كلنا كتوست ماستر الحقيقه وجود فكره ان احنا شفنا شاهدنا الخطبه بتاعتك انا اعتقد ان دي كانت حاجه من احسن الحاجات اللي حصلت في الورشه دي لان احنا شفنا كمان تطبيق عملي للنقط اللي حضرتك اتكلمت فيها شكرا ليك مره ثانيه وانا يعني انا كتبت وراك النقط اللي اتكلمت فيها فانا يعني لو كنت عملت النقط دي خلاص هكسب كده على ضمانتك <تصفيق> ان شاء الله راح تكسبين ان شاء الله لا وبعدين عايز اكسب ست مرات من فضلك <تصفيق> شكرا لك العفو حياتي دلوقتي نقدم شهاده للتوست ماستر المتميز محمد عبد الله العيسى اللي مشاركه معنا اليوم في الورشه بشال سيرتن تو شو ذا سيرتيفيكيت Thank you very much. شكرا لكم شكرا ممتن كثيرا لإعطاء هذه الفرصة شكرا لك دي تي أم خالد عبد الله على إعطاء هذه الفرصة سعدت جدا بلقائكم وأتمنى لكم التوفيق في هذا المؤتمر. شرفنا أستاذ. شكرا. And now. I'd like to give the podium back to DTAC 2022 Chairman TM Vishal Edward Khan to deliver this meeting's closing remarks. DTM Vishal, podium's all yours. Thank you very much, uh, MC Toastmaster Dalia Ilham. First of all, I would like to thank all the participants over here for making this event. It is uh, it's only because of the participants uh, that makes this event happen. And now I would like to come up to the, the most important people, the real 
uh, team who has actually worked on it to make today's event very successful. And I would like to start with Toastmaster Dalia. Very, very energetic, on the spot, a lot of presence of mind. Absolutely great job, Toastmaster Dalia, for doing it. I would also like to thank our PR team for those wonderful videos that was sent in. I'd like to thank our, uh, our, our timer team, uh, Toastmaster Dinesh. He's always on the job on top of it. The moderator team, which is handled by Toastmaster Mohammed Vikaruddin for doing a great job. And uh, of course, our trio and uh, our, our, <clears throat> our, our leader uh, was given us this uh, guidance at DQD Khalid for his uh, support and guidance. I always uh, go back to him whenever it's anything about DTAC. So I would like to especially thank our speakers, wonderful speakers who have been from international and uh, really uh, appreciate the time and the words of wisdom. Starting with Mark Lee Brown, uh, DTM Sarah Khan, and uh, to Smashim, I mean DTA Muhammad Al Isa. Thank you so much for your words of wisdom. It uh, it definitely resonates in our lives. We were all able to connect to it, and I'm sure uh, it will only add value into a near future. So, with that, I would like to just remind you of tomorrow's event. We will be having another exciting day tomorrow, which is the 21st May. So, I'll just do a quick. So, tomorrow is basically the awards night. Uh, it starts in the morning. And then we have the PQD Awards. We have also an Arabic session of very, very uh, prominent speaker, Dr. Ahmed. We will have the CGD Awards and we'll take a small break and we'll resume at 3 p.m. And then we'll continue with our awards, that is the PRM Awards. And we'll also have an education session. So stay tuned for tomorrow because uh, tomorrow is also very, very exciting. Thank you all very much for your support. Thank you. And with that, I conclude the meeting and the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. I will just switch out the recording. Let me stop recording. Yeah. Yeah. Should I stop?